Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Professor. Yeah, good morning, Angel. Hi. Uh, so uh, it's uh, 20th, uh, January 20th. Today is January, January 20th. We have just two more days left after today. Yeah. Um, so um, we have to wrap up really fast. Um, so I see uh, seven people here. And I saw how many people in the, uh, OK, today, currently eight people, uh, eight people in the uh, uh, today's forum. Um, so yeah, um, just need uh, one person is hasn't joined our collaborate session yet. Now, so we're gonna uh, uh, I'm gonna talk just two more things from the bond so that we can move on to the next topic. Uh, you understand basically this is <clears throat> by now this is very. Uh, clear because we've done um, we've done the uh, 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 time value of money, so we understand that there is a uh, there is an inverse relationship between price and the yield. In other words, because the present value, the, the value of any financial asset, is basically uh, the present value, right? So it's the result of discounting. Present value is the result of discounting. So uh, when yield goes down, in other words, yield is in our uh, discount rate, right? When the yield goes down, uh, the price will have to go up, right? Uh, when yield goes up, the price will have to go down. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Whatever as financial asset it may be, stock, bond, they all have the same relationship. When the discount rate goes up, the valuation goes down. When the um, uh, uh, discount rate goes down, the valuation goes up. I mean, the stocks plummeted. The stocks plummeted uh, over the last, you know, uh, a few days, you know, pretty much, you know, like uh, three, four days losing streak. I, uh, I mean, beginning of since the beginning of this Monday, this week, the stocks have uh, like had a three day um, losing streak. But then, you know, it's rebounding today. And why? Because because of this fear of uh, Federal Reserve raising interest rate. But think, and I've been telling you, all the returns are related. And uh, the Fed funds rate um, is the baseline of all interest rates. And return is, you know, uh, interest rate is a kind of return, rate of return. So as the Fed funds rate is expected to, uh, Fed funds rate expected to go up. Uh, and together with, you know, a bond, the uh, treasury yield, right? Uh, yield on the treasury, right? They are expected to go up. Then the discount rate goes up. And of course, in case of stock, the discount rate is, you know, determined by capital asset pricing model, but they all are based, based on, you know, uh, uh, based on the, uh, uh, they are all based on the, uh, 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 the, uh, risk-free return, which is this, right? If the risk-free return goes up, all uh, discount rates go up. So therefore, all, all you know, uh, returns go up. And then stock price would have to go down. The valuation goes up. So this inverse relationship is very important. Um, very important uh, aspect in both economics and finance, right? 
And mathematically, we understand this inverse relationship because it's it's discounting is basically a fraction, right? You are dividing something by one plus r, and as r goes up, right, uh, the present value will have to go down. Now, uh, and that, with that being said, uh, where was I? So we understand this inverse relationship. So that's why we can, uh, here's the thing, uh, let's take a look at uh, an example of uh, how we can apply, oh, how we can apply that to our bond portfolio st strategy. I mean, uh, not necessarily portfolio, but even just, you know, uh, investing in a single bond. So for example, you anticipate long-term rates to fall from 6% to 5.5 during the next year. Yeah, this anticipation is not difficult because Federal Reserve constantly, every they meet like eight times or nine times a year. I, I believe eight times. The FOMC meeting, right? There are like eight FOMC meetings per year. Was it nine? I'm not, uh, uh, I gotta check that. But every time there is an FOMC meeting, uh, they have they hold a press conference, right? Of course, you know there has to be press conference. Um, and then uh, Jerome Powell, the uh, uh, chair of the uh, Federal Reserve, uh, uh, basically, you know, uh, uh, releases his uh, guidance, you know, it's called guidance. They call it guidance. How the rates, uh, what position, what stance they has, they take on the uh, monetary policy. So, based on this, uh, based on the uh, guidance, uh, Federal Reserve's guidance, we can tell how the interest rate will move. So, uh, this kind of anticipation can be made. So, you anticipate long-term rates to fall from six to. Five. Uh, we can tell, oh, the if the uh, uh, then the, uh, the the price will go up, right? When the uh, rate falls, the price will go up. But that means, um, so uh, let's see. Um, so what's going to be if the rate changes? You know, I've been telling you, delta is the symbol for change. If the rate changes, what will be the total return for 20-year? 6.5% coupon bond. Okay, uh, the valuation will go up because the rate uh, discount rate goes down. Um, you have 20 years left currently. Currently, 20 years left, and the coupon is 6.5. So we can calculate the uh, bond price at time t. Now, right? Uh, uh, coupon is 6.5. So uh, sixty-five dollars is the uh, annual coupon, and then you know semi-annual is thirty-two point five. Yeah, and then running it through the uh, uh, formula, and then forty semesters, right? Uh, and then we come to one thousand fifty-seven. We already know it's going to be a, a premium bond because our uh, coupon rate is greater than the discount rate. Next year, next year. We have 19 years left next year. 19 years is 38 semesters. So coupon is still 32.50, right? And then uh, half year rate of 5.5 would be 2.7 uh, 2.75%. So then plugging in this, right? With 38 semesters, N, right? That means N is 38. Then it comes to 1,000, 1,116.97. Now the, actually, so here, uh, we have capital gains. Normally, right? Uh, look, I've been telling you, um, yesterday, uh, I was, uh, this is, where, where did I put it? I showed you the um, 
Oh no. Where is it? Yeah. I put, uh, I told you that this is normally what it looks like, right? Uh, premium bond will have capital loss over the life of the bond. Discount bond will have capital gains over the life of the bond. Yes, but that's that's if the discount rate or the yield doesn't change, right? If the discount rate doesn't change, this is what it's gonna, this is the pattern that it's gonna show. But when the discount rate changes, right? Uh, we can have, you know, during the uh, life of the bond, uh, if the discount rate changes or the yield changes, right? There will be a change in the valuation accordingly. So even if it is a premium bond, uh, temporarily there can be capital gains. So uh, think about it. You don't have to hold the bond for the entire life of the bond. I mean, um, if you want to, that's fine. Uh, but uh, usually, you know, um, you can uh, uh, you can have a, you can set up a strategy uh, to. The, the whole point is you want to maximize the holding period return and the holding period return doesn't need to holding period doesn't need to be the entire life of the bond. Right? Makes sense, everyone. So here in this case, there'll be capital gains of $59. And for one year, you will have uh, between now and the next year, you will have a coupon of $65. So then your uh, total return is, uh, fifth, uh, you add them up, that's going to be 124.18, right? Dollar return, total dollar return of 124.18. But you paid, uh, if you buy it today, you pay 1,057. So you divide it by that, you will end up with a total return of 11.74, right? So this is how you can apply the uh, uh, the Fed's guidance, right? In other words, interest rate uh, uh, expectations to our bond uh, investing strategy, right? Does that make sense, everyone? Mm -hmm. I hope it does. Yes. Uh, yeah, good, yeah. good. Yeah. Leslie, yeah, good, good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course, Kyle. Yeah, thank you for confirmation. Now, so where was I? Uh, the next thing is we talked about the uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, yield to maturity and current yield. Um, and Excel has, we're going to do this. Excel has a built-in price function and yield function. We're going to uh, uh, do the exercise. I mean, you know, uh, uh, so we we are revisiting we are revisiting interest rate risk because uh, remember in the first topic right ROI the the uh, last part of the uh, the PDF file was uh, about the uh, uh, three uh, four types of risks right remember and at the time so let me. So we talked about, okay, so maybe four types of risks. Okay, uh, first, uh, in case of bond, the, the biggest risk is always default risk, right? And then uh, inflation, right? Inflation risk. Three, liquidity risk. Remember that? Liquidity. <laughs> My handwriting is really, uh, it, it's difficult to write on the uh, screen, right? So please, you know, uh, uh, have some, uh, take it with some grain of salt. 
Uh, fourth risk is the uh, maturity risk. But uh, as for the maturity risk, I told you, this is also called interest rate risk. And price risk. And at the time I told you, interest uh, maturity risk is uh, associated with, you know, uh, maturity because the longer the maturity, the more uncertainty there is. But then what is that uncertainty about? I told you it's about the interest rate change, right? Because over like long-term maturity, like 30 years, um, it's hard to tell. I mean, within one or two years, you can pretty much, you know, uh, uh, predict the uh, interest rate uh, uh, trend. But you cannot have, you cannot make an accurate interest rate, interest rate trend forecast for longer time uh, frame, like, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So pretty much beyond five years, beyond five years, right? Beyond five years, it's pretty much a question mark. We have no idea. And there can be, uh, uh, multiple fluctuations over 30 years, right? Interest rate can go up or down, right? Multiple times. And if interest rate goes down, then you don't really have that much risk. I mean, the valuation will go up. But, you know, um, uh, and usually the risk is, you know, mostly when interest rate goes up because the uh, valuation uh, goes down. Uh, but that doesn't mean that when interest rate goes down, uh, there is completely no risk. When interest rate goes down, then there is something called, you know, uh, uh, reinvestment rate risk, reinvestment rate risk. Okay, I'm going to talk about it later uh, when it comes to stock. Um, and then according to this, when this happens, right, when the interest rate fluctuates, so does the price. The price will, when interest rate goes up, it goes down. And when it goes up, uh, when it goes down, it goes up, right? Of course, when uh, price goes up, um, if you are holding the existing assets, right? When price goes up, you're happy. Of course, if you're buying new, then obviously it's not a good news. Uh, but you know, uh, still, I'm not saying it's completely a bad news. When prices generally trend up, it's still a good news because Think about it, if you're an investor, long-term investor, right? Even the short-term investor, if you pay, you know, uh, the price is, you know, uh, uh, very expensive for some stock, some, uh, somehow expensive, like, you know, uh, 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 even Bitcoin, let's say, Bitcoin is what, about uh, $60,000? Uh, that's really, really overinflated, but, you know, you wouldn't mind still buying it if it's going to go up to uh, uh, $80,000 in one year or even six months, right? It's the return that matters, right? Not the price. I mean, uh, but if it, it would be better, I mean, if it is undervalued, right? I mean, something that should be 60000 but it is valued 40000 I mean, that's undervalued, right? There will be correction, upward correction sooner or later. Anything undervalued is a buy target. And if it is undervalued, uh, especially in the short term, uh, in the short term, uh, because the correction doesn't take years to uh, uh, happen, the correction happens relatively, you know, uh, over a short, uh, in the short run. So um, uh, the point is always, you know, the reason we are learning this is uh, how to value any asset is to uh, identify which one, which assets are undervalued. So undervalued asset is always uh, a buy target.
right? And you can realize you know, uh, uh, high return relatively in, uh, in the short run. Right? And if the trend, the price trend is you know, uh, up, uh, going up, in the long run, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you will make definitely profit in the long run, right? S&P 500, you know, Dow Jones, NASDAQ, they all took off uh, since like 1990s. Uh, significant, you know, the, the rate of, you know, increase was, you know, uh, compared to prior to 1990s, they, it really, really took off, right? Uh, so that's why it is called interest rate risk. Uh, and I already explained the chances of capital loss due to rate fluctuations as prevailing rate changes, uh, prevailing rate means uh, the discount rate uh, of existing uh, prices of existing bond will change. Yeah, I already talked about this, so I'm not gonna uh, read everything. Uh, very short-term bonds experience little or no fluctuation in prices, uh, therefore expose bondholders to little interest rate risk. Yeah, that's why I've been telling you uh, the longer, the longer, the longer the. Uh, uh, maturity. That's why it's called maturity risk because the longer the maturity, uh, more the more uncertainty, which means there are more chances of you know uh, interest rate fluctuation. Short term, it, it will hard change, you know. Um, and uh, in the short term, uh, it is everything is you know uh, already priced in. The uh, interest rate change uh, is already priced in because it is known in the short in the short term. Interest rate change is known, right? That's why we were able to do this, remember? That's why we were able to do this because, you know, uh, uh, rate will change, you know, uh, uh, long term, this may mean, you know, like uh, uh, longer than one year, right? Next year. Um, so if we know, like, uh, like two-year rate, five-year rate, right? But, you know, the rate I'm talking about is annualized, right? I mean, just because the uh, bond has five-year life, uh, the, the rate, the yield on the bond is not five-year yield. It's just uh, annualized one-year yield we are talking about. So let's take a look at this example. Um, 30-year, if it is 30-year bond, uh, coupon rate is 0, 5, 10. The higher the coupon rate, the impact is less. But, you know, uh, interest rate changes from 6% to 7%. And how does the price change? If it is 30-year bond, uh, if interest rate is 6%, 169, right? If the interest rate, the coupon, uh, not the coupon rate, but the... Uh, uh, discount rate seven goes up to seven percent. Uh, one twenty. The price changes negative twenty five percent, negative twenty five, and it will get uh, smaller. The change will get smaller as the uh, coupon rate goes up. But ten percent coupon rate are uh, clearly a, a premium bond, even at seven percent, still premium bond because it's ten. Coupon rate is ten percent greater than both. Uh, there will be, the price will go down, but that changes, you know, 11.5% uh, uh, only. But look at, you know, when the, uh, uh, between short term and long term, right? 20 years, 10 years, two years, relatively short term. Uh, if the maturity is two years, <clears throat> coupon rate 5%, uh, they will all be discount bond, but uh, 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 at 6%, 981, uh, maybe I can, right, 981, but at 7%, 963. The change is only negative 1.8%, whereas here, a 20-year long-term bond, the change is 11 point. So we come to the conclusion. Uh, the longer the maturity, a slight change in interest rate 
will result in deeper change, bigger change, uh, negative change in price. Okay. On the other hand, the higher the coupon rate, it mitigates. Because, of course, think about it. Coupon is the bigger part of the present value of the bond. Coupon takes bigger part. So the higher the coupon, this drop in price is mitigated. You have relative, in other words, the, it's the cushion, right? And the common sense, it's a common sense. If you get more uh, interest paid from the bond, it acts as a cushion, right? So they kind of, you know, uh, they don't cancel out, but, you know, uh, they are mutually, uh, 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 like, you know, uh, re uh, mutually reinforcing, what should I say, mutually, they are mutually, uh, the coupons and the, uh, uh, the capital loss are mutually uh, alleviating, the alleviating the, uh, the negative uh, impact of the interest rate hike. Okay, so this is what, you know, uh, it's talking about. So that's it. The rest of it is, you know, um, oh, here, it's talking about the reinvestment rate risk. So the reinvestment rate risk is this. So I told you reinvestment rate risk is, uh, interest rate risk is obvious, very obvious when interest rate goes up, but there is no, there is no downside when interest rate goes down, right? To the price of the bond. But then when the interest rate, go, interest rate goes down, there is a uh, uh, downside uh, uh, in reinvestment rate risk. So what does reinvestment rate risk? Uh, The point is, uh, price drop in the bond is greater with bonds. With of course, I already we already talked about that. Um, when coupon rate is lower, then uh, when interest rate goes up, right, the impact the uh, negative or adverse impact to the uh, bond price is greater. Uh, actually, uh, uh, this doesn't explain the reinvestment rate risk, but you know, I, I put it there, <laughs> maybe, you know, uh, uh, it's at the uh, introduction. Uh, when rates go, we are not, but the cash flows, uh, okay, um, When the rate goes up, bondholders' cash flows are discounted at a higher rate. Bond value goes down, but with a higher coupon rate, with higher coupon rate, uh, this impact is less, right? But then, uh, this is a supplementary. Uh, so far, it's just supplementary explanation of how reinvestment, uh, how the uh, higher coupon uh, rate mitigates the uh, adverse impact on the bond price when interest rate goes up. But then, so, but then uh, another aspect is, uh, which uh, seems like, you know, it seems like I haven't talked about here. Um, Suppose you, the, the coupons are received, right? Every, uh, and what do you do with the coupons? Mm -hmm. People generally um, have two choices. When you receive, uh, you have 10 year bond and at 10% coupon, uh, coupon rate, that means for the next 10 years, you will receive $100 every year. Now you can, uh, two choices, you can use it, you can spend it or you can reinvest it. You can reinvest it. And if it is possible to reinvest it at the same 10% rate, this will be good. But then, you know, uh, um, uh, 
uh, it will be a separate it will be a separate instrument because uh, the bond uh, I don't think the bonds generally have reinvestment um, uh, uh, bonds are for reinvestment uh, plans some do but you know uh, uh, most companies wouldn't because if you reinvest that um, uh, the coupons back to the uh, the same pool of bond, then the company's debt company's debt level increases, and some companies wouldn't want that. So then, what you can do is, if you can find another instrument that pays 10% coupon, you will reinvest this in, uh, coupons into that uh, separate instrument. And you can find these 10 uh, the instruments that, can, that will pay 10% when the interest rate is high. But when interest rate goes down, overall interest rate in the market goes down, it will be difficult to find, it will be difficult to find it will be difficult to find uh, instruments that pay 10% anymore because overall interest rate has gone down. Most likely, uh, you can uh, what you can find is uh, something much lower than 10%. So this is why it is called reinvestment rate risk. All those, you know, uh, coupons. Stocks do have dividend reinvestment plans. So uh, but you know, stocks don't guarantee any, you know, uh, stocks don't guarantee any, you know, fixed return. It's not fixed. Stocks, stocks returns are not fixed. But you know, uh, bonds returns, at least interest income, is fixed, right? So, if you, um, uh, but either stock or bond, you know, when uh, rates go down. The reinvest the reinvestment return will be lower. That's why it is called reinvestment rate risk. Okay, all righty. Now uh, bond ratings. You know the final thing. You know um, uh, there are three internationally recognized bond rating agencies: Moody's, Standard and Poor's, and Fitch IBC. Moody's and S and P five are uh, U.S. agencies. But you know, of course, they uh, globally. You know, uh, uh, Fitch IBC is British, it's UK based. You know, uh, but but it's worldwide. And I've been telling you the uh, ratings are like this. You know, uh, they just they just compared. You know, uh, Moody's and uh, S and P. This is just <laughs> what's the difference? I mean, you know, uh, uh, triple B or B double A. What's the difference? The same thing, right? Just uh, just different, you know, uh, different uh, nomen, nomen, uh, nomenclature. Uh, which nom uh, <laughs> I always have a hard time. Uh, uh, nomenclature. It's just a different nomenclature, right? But, you know, the reason they say Look, triple B and above, uh, that's investment grade. Below triple B are called, you know, junk bonds, junk bonds. So junk bond sounds like a bad thing, uh, but what it means is it's high return, but only at high risk. Of course, you cannot have high return at high risk. Some are even, you know, uh, uh, below, look, uh, Uh, below uh, C, double C, right? Default is possible. Uh, from C, default is possible. Default, uh, possible, but recovery is also possible. But below C, uh, I mean C and below, it has already defaulted and the recovery is unlikely. So who's going to, nobody's going to put their money on uh, in, you know, like uh, C bond, right? Grade C or below. 
All right. We're not going to talk about the uh, uh, these things at, okay? We're not going to cover yield differentials. This is not, uh, this isn't, uh, this will be uh, indenture. This is, you know, basically uh, indenture. I told you this is the uh, bond covenant, right? Bond agreement, right? Uh, bond contract. Risk issues, convertible bonds. We're not going to talk about that, okay? So uh, that wraps up everything about uh, our discussion about bond. So we're going to move on to uh, 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 risk and return. Uh, where is, oops, yeah, here, risk and return. Uh, course materials and so I want you to download these two files. Um, but you know, this we're gonna actually that's uh. I took, you know, uh, Spring 220 Apple. I mean, that's already. Uh, we don't need this. We'll we'll download the. Uh, we'll download directly. So at least you need this. So let me and the. Uh, Let me open that. Uh, let's see. There you go, uh, risk and return. Uh, uh, the best thing is to understand risk and return is to actually uh, uh, get, you know, by getting your hands dirty to get to the uh, nits and grits. Uh, so I want you to all go to uh, Yahoo Finance Go to Yahoo Finance, please. And then uh, in the search window, right there, just type in, you can type in Apple or AAPL. Type in Apple or, uh, in the old days, in the old days, you had to type in the exact tickle symbol, right? But then these days, you, you can just type in the name of the company, right? Uh, it, even in 1990s, you had to, <laughs> late 1990s, you had to type in APPL, but now, uh, AAPL, I'm sorry, AAPL. But now, you can type in, uh, there you go. So, we can look at, you know, we can first go to chart and Click on Max. <laughs> Is this chart? I don't know. Yeah, chart. Max. No. Monthly for maximum time frame. Or maybe five, five years. Five years. Five years. You see these 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 that means dividends 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 were paid uh, monthly I want monthly uh, those were when the dividends were paid and you see S that's when the stock split happened right that's when the stock split happened if you extend the timeline to maximum.
and by its maximum, so year annual. Look. You can tell Apple went public in 19, uh, 1980, 1980 or 19, yeah, I believe 1980 or 81, I believe 81. And when, uh, it must be 80. And then you might wonder, um, what was the price then? Uh, it looks like it was like 10 cents at the time. No, it wasn't 10. It was like $10. It was like $10. But why is it showing as 10 cents? Look, look here. What's the price here at this time? Hmm. That's like 14 cents, right? Huh? Was it really 14 cents? No, no. It was about uh, IPO price. Apple's IPO price was like $10. But why is it like that? Well, it, everything has been re, uh, rescaled after stock split, right? There were uh, at least like, you know, um, two splits here in 1990 and 2004. And also recently, I mean, there were at least five, if I remember correctly, there's been about five uh, stock splits at least over the life of Apple. And that's, you know, uh, like 40 years, 40 years, over 40 years. So after stock split, they, uh, they apply post split price to all the data prior to the split. Otherwise, then, you know, uh, there will be a, a huge shift in the price. Think about it. Apple was about, you know, $600, 600 something um, in 2012 or 20, uh, if I remember correctly, because I, I've been, I held the Apple shares since 2010 and i think it was around 2012 or 2014 uh when they split so when i bought apple back in 2010 or 2012 it was like 500 dollars and about two years later or one year later or two years later it went up to a 660 or something like that and then it split. And I, you know, when the price went up to 600, I sold, I sold apples <laughs> just to realize that 20% gain. I shouldn't have sold because after split, it you know, uh, uh, soon recovered uh, its previous price level. I mean, it grew like you know by like you know thousand percent, you know, uh, even after split. But then, then I bought back again. Uh, the thing is, <sighs> so when the price was around the 660, it had, that was like 2014, if I remember correctly. They had six to one split or seven to one split. Was it eight to one split, uh, uh, one to eight split? Or it was probably seven to one split because I remember um, if it is six to one split, then the post split price at, has to be uh, 110 uh, because it was like around right before split, the price was like 660. Uh, but the post split price was like 80 something. So it must have been something like seven to one split. Um, so then the price was a uh, post split price was like 80 something. And then soon it got, you know, uh, uh, that was like 2014. Let me check what the price was in 2014. Um, what was it? 
was the price 2014 was like uh, oh and even after that even after that there were a couple of more splits so uh, everything has to be uh, um, prorated everything had to be prorated right so uh, anyway um, look at Apple is standing it's 160 this is you know uh, annual right end of the year you know uh, annualized uh, end of the year I'm sorry end of the year so this is as of the end of you know 2021 Uh, so if you consider, think about it, from 10 cents to uh, 160, 169, from 10 cents to 169, think about it. Simple calculator. I mean, if I, in 1981, I was, you know, college sophomore, you know, junior, uh, sophomore to junior. Uh, and I always regret, had I known, and if I had money at the time, and if, I would have bought Apple, you know, like at least 100 shares of Apple at the time. I would have uh, gathered all 100 shares of Apple, $10 per share, 100 shares, that's $1,000. If I could, you know, uh, somehow gather, you know, uh, $1,000 at the time and bought Apple, look, 169. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I, I should have done this. Open parenthesis, 169 minus 0.1, okay, divided by 0.1. That's 1,689 times, which is 100 hundred and sixty hundred and sixty eight thousand uh hundred and sixty eight thousand nine hundred percent growth right hundred and sixty eight thousand nine hundred percent growth and make sense uh my thousand dollars would have been now put nine thousand uh thousand uh three zeros here it would have been it would have become 1.689 million dollars i mean uh, uh one million one million i'm sorry one million six hundred eighty nine thousand dollars right times my one thousand Right, and then you know, uh, of course, if you you must have a long term, uh, you must be patient. You must be you know a long term uh, investor. And I always you know uh, regret. You know, I always say, if only I can time travel. I mean, someone please invent time machine, <laughs> and I would. I can easily uh, bring my, you know, I can easily bring $10,000 <laughs> from today back to 1981 and buy Apple. Uh, then it would be, you know, uh, uh, 16 million, 890,000 something, you know, today. Um, but, but, you know, uh, the point is we want to go to a, uh, uh, historical data I want to go to historical data so are you all there everyone yeah. I can't see so let me yes professor yeah, yeah. okay uh, yeah of course if there's enough someone please invent time but of course you know there's a lot of you know uh, there are many uh uh, theories about time travel. If you time travel back to the past, then you might end up, you might not end up in the same future as it is now. Huh? Because uh, 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 any small, small um, infraction or any small infraction of uh, 
events in the past would result in totally different future uh, or, or one of one of the uh, many different multi uh, parallel universe so <laughs> i may not end up here i may not be a college professor <laughs> may not be uh, uh, meeting you uh, on youtube uh, or, you know not youtube but meeting you over the internet over uh, <laughs> it will be a totally you know different could have been so I'm, I'm still thankful uh, for where I am now and what I am, <laughs> even though I cannot travel back uh, and invest in Apple uh, back in 81. Oh, Kyle, you have a question? Yeah, I was going to make a statement about what you just said in particular. Uh-huh. Yeah, you, go ahead. The statement you made about every time, let's say somebody does travel into the past, they change one thing, it changes the future. How would we ever really know if somebody is time traveling if the future is consistently being changed? This is just a theory. Yeah, yeah, I could I couldn't quite make out, but you know, how would they ever know that uh, you? Uh, what was the question? Well, how how would they ever know that uh, you would and not end up in the same future because you wouldn't know what the? Uh, is that the question? Hmm? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, you. I wouldn't know. I mean, uh, maybe I. I will. I will retain the the memory of the current universe. I mean, uh, how would they ever know? Uh, how would they ever know time travel exists if small changes in the past makes a dream? Uh, but you would know, right? Actual traveler. Yeah, only only the actual traveler would know because you would retain it, and if it is. You would retain you retain the memory of the present universe, right? This universe, and even if you end up in a uh, uh, different parallel universe, your memory of the current uh, uh, universe would still be retained, right? So you would not. I'm not. I'm not sure. You know. I mean, it's an interesting topic, but uh, so uh, if you so everyone is in. Uh, where am I? So everyone is in the uh, Apple, right? And everyone has pressed historical data, right? Everyone has pressed historical data, right? Everyone? Yes, Professor. Okay. So then first, uh, I will change the frequency to monthly, monthly data. And then let's use five-year time frame. Five years then. Uh, January 19th through uh, January 19, 2022. Uh, just to make sure, I will make this. Oh, no, 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 not that one. Uh, okay, start date. I will make the start date. No, 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 That takes too much time. I'll make it uh, 2000. I'll make it December of. December 2016. Okay. Uh, 16. Then we'll have five years, you know, an extra month. We need an extra month to ensure 60 data points. You can set the start date uh, the first day. But, you know, the data will be, data we will get will be the end of the month data. So hit uh, enter, done, right? Make sure. So then what happened monthly apply apply then you'll see even the dividends when dividends were paid and you know, the dividends are you know mediocre just about you know 20 cents so um we need to download it what happened we need to download right uh download and it is you know downloaded uh 
don't just open it. Uh, go to the folder and see it is there. Okay. Then click open. All right. Now, uh, the first thing I want to do is highlight the entire worksheet, right? You click on this and the entire worksheet is highlighted. And then change the font because the way it is, you get tired. I mean, the, the basic font, uh, the default font is always, you know, not vision friendly. I mean, you will ruin your vision, you know, looking at a font like this. And I know because for the last 30, 30 years of my life, I've been dealing with, you know, uh, fonts like this and, you know, uh, uh, it's a good thing, you know, I haven't lost my, you know, my eyesight isn't severely weakened. I mean, I don't have good uh, eyesight, but um, uh, so then, you know, I will increase the font to uh, something like 14 change the font face to something more appealing. I don't like that, you know, because, uh, uh, you know, this makes me bored very easily. The font, the default font makes me, you know, uh, already makes me, uh, it turns me off. I don't want to work with that, you know, uh, data. So once you have process, uh, treated the data, processed the data to this level, uh, yeah, that's fine. We'll just save it first. We'll save it before you lose the uh, the thing. We'll save it uh, and make sure uh, when you save, make sure it is wor uh, Excel workbook, not CSV data. Excel workbook, okay. And then you can name it anything, but I will name it um, Apple. Uh, it's already named Apple, so W. 22, winter 22, okay, or 22 winter. <laughs> okay, all right, are you all there? Yes. Okay, good, good. Now, if you're all there, it's one o'clock, one o'clock, so this is, it's a good time to take a break. So let's take a 10 minute break. And once we come back, we're gonna work with this data. Okay, so let's take a 10 minute break.
All right, we're back. We're back. So um, the next thing I want you to do, next thing I want you to do is, I already did this. Uh, uh, just, you know, uh, this is just to make it easier for later. Uh, the first row, highlight the uh, select the entire first row, right, by clicking on the uh, row number, select the entire higher uh, first row and uh, uh, under underscore uh, underline 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 the labels and the uh, uh, center the labels uh, because uh, numerical data are always you know right aligned uh, so if you don't uh, and the uh, Uh, text, text is always left aligned. So um, if you don't, uh, if you don't, you know, uh, make this adjustment to the data set, then later, uh, and especially if you don't change the font, uh, later on, you know, you don't know which one is label uh, and which one is the data string for which label. You don't know. It's going to be very difficult to uh, see that. Uh, I mean, uh, at least in Excel, each uh, there's grid line, so uh, it's less confusing. But if you uh, copy it into like Word file, uh, there's no grid line, and it gets very confusing. So do that to make it, you know, um, uh, to make the demarcation line between uh, each data string, um, uh, you know, quite visible and obvious. Yep. Yeah. Professor, may, may I make yeah. a suggestion real quick? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you want to click somewhere in the data, in the data, mm -hmm. so somewhere, click somewhere within on one of the numbers. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and do that. Okay. Anywhere. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. And now on the keyboard, hit Control mm -hmm. T as in table. Mm -hmm. Control T. Yep. And. Okay, what's that? Okay. All right, super. And now just hit OK because now it's asking, it's going to turn that into a data table. Mm -hmm. You have the checkbox next where it says my table has headers. Super. Mm -hmm. So I hit OK. Okay, cool. So now we okay. have mm -hmm. um, a little easier to read. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Now in column H, if we're going to start making formulas that are referencing mm -hmm. these, mm -hmm. we would put that in column H. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, the table is going to expand. Okay. So then uh, now when we reference this stuff later with pivot tables and charts, mm -hmm. we can just reference the table itself. We don't have to keep going and uh, adjusting the, the range where the data is. So we don't have to do it manually anymore. You just type in, okay, table one. So you'll see at the top on yeah, the yeah. ribbon, it says table yeah, design. Yeah. There's a new tab there with a whole bunch of special functions just for the table. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, but then you know uh, when we use you know um, uh, when when um, when we uh, build a formula into it. I mean, you can name range, and you know uh, you can yep. uh, uh, you know name the variable, and but then that variable that you know uh, variable name is uh, you have to designate it every table every so. I don't, you know, that that would just make it. Uh, I mean, there, there's a benefit to that, but there is, you know, some uh, sometimes it's, you know, uh, not uh, that necessary. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, this one is good. This one is fine, and thank you for that input. Uh, but you know, let me. Uh, eventually, it's um, uh, it's the uh, uh, something that it's the. This the uh, statistical variables that we are gonna need from this. So the data, I mean, it's fine. You can have every row uh, have different shades of color. So it would be, but you know, uh, uh, that's individual data point is not what we are focusing on. So we'll just uh, leave it as is. And then uh, this is the original data set, uh, and we're gonna use uh, we're gonna um, we're going to select a, uh, just, you know, specific data set from this. So 
I'm going to do that in the next uh, worksheet. So uh, you can highlight, uh, you can, uh, you know, click this and it's going to highlight everything. And then you can copy and then uh, click this and open a new worksheet and select this A1 and paste it there. And then here, I um, what I'm going to do is, uh, we don't need volume, right? We don't need vo volume is also an imp important indicator when, you know, uh, the prices, uh, prices move, but you know, uh, how strong, I mean, how reliable is that movement? Every day you see, uh, uh, in, you know, um, you see prices move, but the move, the market price is the result, still the result of even a small, small uh, amount of trading. So sometimes when price fluctuates, uh, but if you want to know whether this price fluctuation is a uh, matter uh, spurious or spurious, you know, uh, uh, what should I say, a fickle, fickle or ah, trivial, even for trivial, uh, trivial amount of transactions, the market price will move because that's the only, that's the only trading that happens. Uh, but if you want to see how that is uh, not trivial, then you got to see the volume. But you know, uh, uh, that's not what we are interested in now. So I'm going to, you can click the column heading and the whole column is highlighted. And I don't need it, so we'll delete that. And then we have four price points. I've been telling you uh, during the uh, trading, you know, there is no the opening price, closing price, highest during the trading, lowest during the trading. Okay, and then then the uh, uh, open, high, low, close. Uh, and what is this? Adjusted close. Adjusted close is the uh, the data that we need because adjusted close means it's been adjusted for uh, stock splits and dividends, so that we don't have to uh, uh, worry about uh, uh, dividends and splits. So we're gonna use only adjusted close. The rest of them we're gonna delete. But again, this is monthly data, so this means the uh, uh, opening price for that month, uh, highest during the month, lowest during the month, uh, closing of the month. Okay. And uh, on, one more thing. The data is now uh, sorted in ascending order, ascending, meaning from the, the earliest time to the latest time. Uh, it will be easier to put it in descending order. To put it in descending order uh, by date, we'll select one date, select one date, go to home, right? You see this sort, right? You just sort uh, in descending order, newest to oldest. And the uh, 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 earliest, I mean, the, uh, the latest comes first, comes on top. Uh, the oldest comes to the bottom. And then, as I said, uh, it's not only the date, uh, the, the entire data set moves together, right? Um, so you can highlight column C, D through E, uh, B, B through E, highlight those columns and delete. We don't need that. And here, if you want, for other purposes, we, al we already have, we always have the original data set there. Uh, so here, uh, I'm going to rename the, uh, 
the sheet label, worksheet label, uh, I'm going to uh, rename it. Uh, what? Mm, I'll call it mean and STDV, standard deviation. Mean and standard deviation. Okay. Now, I'm going to rename adjusted close to um, PT. And means price at time T. Price at time T. And then uh, these are actually dollar prices, right? Dollar prices. So uh, highlight everything. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but it's unnatural. I mean, <laughs> you don't have anything below cent, right? We don't have anything below any denomination below cent. So uh, we don't need all these decimal decimal places. So I'm going to uh, select, right? Go to this part and select dollars, right? Then everything is in dollars, right? And then I will uh, simply extend it to the right. Uh, before before I do that, I'm sorry. Before I do that, uh, normally times time subscript is a subscript subscript. So I'm going I'm going to highlight I'm going to highlight the T at home. Uh, uh, these are cosmetic sort of like cosmetic things, but you know it's important. Uh, I mean you know uh, it's not as important. It's not like you know uh, the world will. Uh, the world will come to an end if I don't <laughs> use subscript, but it's my preference. I turn it into subscript, okay? So that, okay, you don't have to do that if you don't want to. Then I copy to the right and then change it, uh, change that P to R, okay? So that's return. Right. So we want to find return. Okay. And by definition, what is return? Uh, and uh, let me uh, make, let me bold it. Right. What is return? By definition, uh, we know what return is. Uh, let me use. We know what return is, uh, and holding. Uh, if you are talking about holding period return, right? We already know. Uh, Capital gains, right? Plus uh, summation. Sum of all the cash flows, and then Cash flows at time t, right? Where t runs from from one, right, to t over um, the from, let's say, zero, okay? 
Yeah, which is, you know, uh, but this is holding period return, but we are only, we need only uh, like, oh, no, 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 what am I? But we only need the return uh, for one period, for one period, right? Which is, you know, in this case, Uh, okay, uh, return for one period, right? Um, uh, uh, this will take R T, right? Equals then um, one period, a single period version of this equation is this formula is then. Okay, uh, I set time t minus, I set time t minus one, or I set time t minus one. Now, this is one single period version of return. Why? Uh, first of all, pt minus pt minus one, that's the capital gains, right? Let me make it a little, whole thing a little bigger. Okay. Uh, that's capital gains. And then what about then uh, cash flows? Uh, in case of stock, that cash flows would be dividends, but the dividends are paid quarterly. And this is monthly data, so we don't have, uh, this is monthly data. So the dividend is not paid monthly. So that's why we are using adjusted. That's why we are using adjusted close. Okay, that's why we are using adjusted close. Okay. So you need to do this with me. Everyone has done this with me so far, right? Everyone has done this? Yes. Okay, right. good, good. Okay, good. Then now let's find return then. Uh, so the return will be uh, PT. Um, this is PT minus, what is PT minus one? Hmm? Uh, C3, a uh, B3. In B3, yes, B3. Yes, if this is PT, then this is PT minus one, right? The price in, January 2022, it should be the uh, price of December 2021. That's PT minus one, one period, right? And divided by PT minus one. Now here's uh, one more one more thing. Um, uh, let me hit enter, and then this is not in percentage, so I'm gonna put it into percentage. Percentage, right? There you go. Give it a, and don't don't leave it rounded. Give it at least two decimal places. I've been telling you always give it a, uh, ex, excessive rounding is distorting the picture, distorting the fact. So give it like two to three decimal places. Now, 
One question is, um, it's dated January 1st, December 1st. So are we, you know, uh, is that the January 1st price or December 1st? No, I've been telling you, this is the closing, closing price of the month. Of course, January hasn't closed yet. January hasn't ended yet. So uh, this is as of yesterday. I'm a closing price yesterday. But you know, that's that's the uh, most recent uh, price data we have. What about the, uh, so then why is it like this? It's just the way, it's just the way the uh, dates are expressed. I mean, calendar dates. I mean, even if it is monthly data, they use, you know, first, the first calendar date of the month to represent the uh, the month, right? So it's like, you know, although it is, you know, labeled um, like that, that actually means the uh, closing price of the month. Now, once you have this, then the rest is, you know, home free. I mean, you're home free, right? Uh, the rest is like walking through a park. It's like a breeze. You're breezing. Just bring it to the southeast corner and just drag it down, all the way down. But you know, you stop here because uh, to to have return here, you need also data here, but we don't have any more data. So uh, stop there. We have already, you know, uh, monthly returns. You know, we have individual 60. That must be 60, it must be 60. 60 individual returns, if I highlight it. Oh, I got it, even 61. Doesn't matter. I mean, 60, usually five years, 60 data points, but this is okay. Because anyway, um, 60 or 61, um, statistically, it won't make, uh, uh, it won't make much difference. Actually, the difference, statistical difference would be uh, very insignificant. So once we have all these monthly uh, returns, then what is something we want to know? Oh, what is the average? Okay, what is the mean? So here we uh, use a simple mean, mean or average. I'll, I'll just call it average. Wouldn't it be naturally, um, naturally wouldn't be, uh, 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 you know, uh, naturally the right thing you would like to know? What was the... Uh, monthly average monthly return over the last five years and we're going to use simply the uh, uh simple average simple average right simple average oh this is good 3.36 it was even better than before so for the last five years right for the most recent five years Average monthly return was 3.36%. I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to bold and highlight because this is an important uh, data, important uh, uh, maybe not on the line, but I will center, I will center this. Yeah, what does this mean? Uh, on average, right, Apple grew monthly at 3%. Of course, you know, there were good months and bad months, right? Some good and some bad, but on average, it grew this. Now, think about it. This means this is simple average, not geometric average, of course. Um, and you might wonder, why not geometric average? Look, uh, geometric average is relevant when we use quarterly data and quarterly and annual data. Yeah, they, there is no uh, fundamental correlation between uh, data points. If it is quarterly, why? I said fundamental. Fundamental meaning based on the financial statements. Right? And think about it. Quarterly data, qu 
quarterly data is based on the uh, earnings report. Companies release their earnings data, earnings report, quarterly. So then the price reflects, quarterly data will reflect actual company's earnings growth, right? The, the profit growth, earnings growth of the company. So they will be, there will be a correlation right between the data sets but then anything below quarterly data i mean monthly data it's not based on the financial statements uh, it's mainly you know um, it's quite arbitrary in other words they are like random occurrences market doesn't know for sure what was the apple's earnings last month market doesn't know because apple doesn't uh apple isn't obligated to provide that data to the public, right? Makes sense? So monthly data, weekly, monthly price, weekly price, or daily price, those are like random, random occurrences. When, when they are random, it's just like, there's no difference between like horizontal data or cross-sectional data, or longitudinal data or horizontal data. There's no longitudinal, latitudinal data, or horizontal or vertical time series or cross-sectional, there's no difference because it's like uh, it's random occurrence. So we use, you know, just simple average. And most likely, I mean, because it's simple average, it's not going to exactly, if I uh, think about it, um, uh, rough idea is from this price, um, try this. Uh, it's a different column, so I'm not going to have to. I do um, this times one plus this is to 61, but you know, uh, count. That will give us 61. Or maybe uh, rather than this, maybe, right? That's going to give us 61, right? And it should be close to, uh, well, it's, it's kind of overstating because it's simple average, right? But, you know, the, the point is um, we would get to something uh, similar to, uh, 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 the, cur uh, the current price of Apple. Uh, but as I said, you know, uh, it's simple average, so it's going to be overstating. But what is the, uh, what is the uh, meaning or importance of the uh, uh, average return, average monthly return? Look, this is called also expected return. Expected meaning, you know, uh, uh, that's what you can expect in the future. So next month, February, most likely the return will be 3%, 3.36. Of course, the actual return will not be exactly the same because everything is, you know, you will never find 3.36. It's just the mean, average of all. You will never find 3.36. Uh, if you want, uh, also, uh, we can do this. Uh, you can copy these, uh, open another worksheet, paste, but now this time paste only, go to paste values, only values, not the formula, only values. Okay. And then, then there's no formula. It's just it's just a number, and let's sort this from highest to largest to the smallest. Voila. We can tell also when was the best time, what was the best month during the last five years. August was the best, best month. August was the best, best month. 
August 2020. The return was 21.44. What was the, uh, okay, I don't need this here. What was the uh, worst month? When was the worst month? November 2018. They had almost 20% loss, but you know, it's only natural. I mean, the market fluctuates, but do you see 3.3 something? Yeah, our mean was 3.36. The average will never happen. I mean, by coincidence, simply by coincidence, it can happen, but it's only a coincidence. I mean, only one month, July 2017, was close to our average, but that's what average is. It's a neutral number. It's a very neutral number. I've been, uh, maybe I told you about this. I mean, if you uh, play uh, a die, dice game, right? Um, suppose, you know, you're rolling a dice. You have just one chance of rolling a dice and you roll a dice. Whatever number comes up, and there are six numbers on a dice, one through six, whatever number comes up, let's say you get uh, the same amount of dollar as the number. So then your possible payoffs are $1 to $6. Right. I ask this question: What is the expected? What is the expected payoff to you? Hmm? What is the expected payoff? Hmm? Now I'm asking you the same question. I mean, if you can win the same number of dollars as the number that comes up on a dice, what is your expected payoff? What do you think? What is your expected payoff? Anyone? Hmm? Anybody? Some people, some people say, you know, six dollars. Some people say one dollar, and I ask them why. Uh, someone that says six dollars, six dollars, or uh, someone that said six dollars, is a very optimistic person. Well, it's expected return, you know. I, you know, uh, I expect to. Uh, I expect to uh, win $6. Well, but that's so wishful thinking. You need to distinguish between, differentiate the wishful thinking from the expectation. Ex expectation is not a wishful thinking. Sometimes expect, you have a very optimistic, you can have an optimistic expectation. That's, that's a wishful thinking. But expectation, about, there's no guarantee that can happen. Expectation has to be some, uh, be based on some rationale, some rationale, right? Some uh, rational reasoning, rational reasoning. Someone who says zero, uh, one dollar, zero cannot come up, right? Everyone knows zero cannot come up. Uh, someone says, you know, uh, uh, one dollar, at least one dollar. And I ask, ask him why? At least one will come up. Yeah, but that's that's kind of you know uh, uh, pessimistic outlook. Uh, um, the answer is the correct answer is three point five. 3.5. Why? There's no such number as 3.5 on a dice. But still, why 3.5? Because that's the average, average of all the numbers. So it may never happen. It may never happen. But that's, that's the most rational reasoning. Of course, suppose you know the the numbers each every, each side of the uh, dice has different uh, different weights. In other words, this is not a perfect cube. A perfect cube will all have a perfect cube will have uh, is perfectly cut. So. Every side will have the same probability of coming up, right? Every side will have to have, uh, I will just write six, uh, four, 
and you know uh, the other every side has the same probability of coming up then they will all have one over six but if this is not the case but if uh, some side this is not a, uh, a perfect cube or a, not a fair cube or unbiased cube but if this is a biased cube uh, the probabilities will be different if the probabilities are different then we use weighted average but the point is um, uh, these numbers are uh, randomly right random distribution random outcomes random these these numbers are random distri uh, randomly distributed numbers in other words there is no I told you there is no correlation between each of them. They they all have the same probability of coming up. So it's only uh, rational uh, that we assume. And then think about it. They have this. Let's think about the uh, uh, distribution. The, uh, and there are negative months. But look at the number of negative months. Twenty three. Out of 61, if it is 23, there are more, there are more positive months, right? Months with positive returns. And that's why, of course, if it is evenly 50-50, if it is 50-50, 50 50% 50, 50, 50 uh, negative, 50% positive, then uh, they will exactly cancel out. The average and, is hmm? zero. Yeah, average will be zero then. The average but, is... hmm? but the average is not zero because average is you know uh, 3.36 and that is supported by the number of i mean out of 60 about one third is negative two third is positive right no wonder so now then the next naturally the next question you would have next question you would have is is that um, okay then what is the uh, uh, average deviation from the mean every month so how far I mean isn't it naturally uh, your next question I mean in my mind I think it was so natural because if average was you know 3.36 so what how far were how far was each actual actual return uh, away, right? How far each actual return is away from the mean. And if I know, that's called, you know, deviation. If I know the average of this deviation, I will, and with the probabilities, if the probabilities can be known, then I can have a better prediction of the next month's return. So that's why Okay, so then, yeah, let's do this. So um, let's take the difference, okay? Difference or deviation, right? Difference means, you know, um, difference between actual return, difference between actual return and the average. And since average is down here, right, uh, you will need to lock it. You will need to lock it. You know, uh, F4, right? Hit F4 because uh, you have to lock it. Otherwise, you know, it won't be C64. It will be C65, 66. So you don't want that to happen. So you lock it. Everyone lock it, right? So difference is like this. And then you drag it down drag it down, right? Then these are uh, individual, uh, these are called difference terms, difference terms. Um, in other words, RT, RT minus mean, okay? Uh, I cannot put bar on it. Can I put, uh, let's, oh. Uh, I have to use okay. 
second. No, uh, it's hard to find. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, maybe mean. Label <laughs> MR. Ah, never mind. Labeling is uh, so you know, labeling is a headache most of the time. So let's call it R. So, difference is the uh, RT minus R. In other words, difference is RT minus R. Now, so yeah, if these are differences, right, or deviations, then if we take the average, right, of those, if you take the average of those, so this is already an average uh, command. So if I drag it to the right, the formula is copied. But if I do that, if I take the, uh, uh, right, mean of the, it will be zero. You can't do nothing. You can't do, it will be zero. Why? Uh, because all the deviations from the mean, half of them are, now in this case, half of them are positive, half of them are negative. Right? So that's why. Because the def deviation from the mean, half of them are positive, half of them are. So then there's no point in doing this. Uh, we cannot find the average, so you might wonder, we cannot find the average deviation. Uh, yes, yes, we can. What we can do is uh, we'll, we'll square it. Because if you square, uh, everything squared is always positive. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it's negative or positive because it's the distance. De deviation is the distance away from the mean. So it um, doesn't matter. Every, everything can be, you know, uh, turned into positive. Now. And if we so square it, then everything will be positive. And it's not a difficult thing. Uh, this term squared. Okay. And then since it is, you know, uh, let's keep the uh, percentage. So uh, uh, and two decimal places, okay, and then drag it down, all right, then I can also just, you know, I can, you might think, oh, because I want to take the average of, I can, you know, uh, drag it to the right, no, here, uh, here's a little uh, issue, uh, that will be the, simply the average of the, um, uh, square terms. So that's not uh, what we want. Um, so everything we have, you know, full 60, 61 data point, right? 61 data points. And then, uh, so what we want to do next is we want to sum everything because to find the average, you will have to sum everything, right? So I'm going to sum everything. And then uh, this is, I'll call this SSQ. Okay. What does it mean? What does that SSQ mean? Uh, SS, that stands for. So, 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 huh? Someone sum said? Yes, yeah, sum of squares. Sum of squares. Uh, was it Yang? Hmm? Yeah. Okay, Yang, I'm going to give you five points. I mean, 0 0.5. You definitely did your homework, right? Um, as I'm going to call this. Uh, I'm going to use like light. 
I'm gonna make it lighter. There's two. Something like this. <clears throat> Sum of squares. Okay. And then uh, <clears throat> we wanted to uh, find the average of these. So if we find the average, then it's going to be. Uh, I'm just going to copy this just for the uh, format, not the. Uh, I'm going to uh, divide it by 61 because uh, 61 because we have 61 data points, but you know, we'll count. Open parenthesis. And it will count exactly 61 uh, rather than relying on our uh, visual, right? Relying on our visual, we want to, uh, but then, oh, so yeah, we divided by 61. Um, but that's not, that's not enough yet. Why? Right? We'll have to subtract one. Why? Uh, here's a, a statistical uh, thing called, you know, a loss of one degree of freedom loss of one degree of freedom. And it always uh, happens with the sample data. Uh, sample is a local data set. Local data is sample. Why is it local? Because look, think about it. Apple has existed for 40 years, right? So if we compile, uh, if we use the entire data set from 1981, all the way from 1981, 40, a full 40 year, uh, worth of data that's called population. Anything local, uh, anything from that population is uh, local from that population is called uh, sample. And for uh, for population, you don't have to subtract one. But for local data, for sample, you have to subtract one to make adjustment for loss of one degree of freedom. And I'm gonna get to that uh, later because we don't have so. Uh, so we divide it by 60, right? I mean, this will ensure it's going to be 60 data points. Click enter. Yeah. And this is called what? This is called variance. So what is variance? Variance is a kind of average deviation of individual data, individual returns, returns data from the mean. But then this is uh, squared data, squared. It's not, it's not the actual thing, but it's blown up. It's a squared thing. So uh, this doesn't do the uh, uh, justice of the actual picture. This doesn't do the justice of the actual picture because it's blown up. But we know how to take it back to the life size. This is not the life size picture of this is not the life-sized picture of uh, the, the average deviation from the mean. Mm -hmm. This is not. So then, you know, uh, uh, but we already know uh, how to take it back to the life-sized picture. Why? Because we blew it up by squaring. So then uh, how do we take it back to, how do we convert it back to life size? We'll have to take the square root, right? If you take the square root of the squared term, a blown up picture, then it will take us back to the life size picture. So I'm just gonna copy that for only for the uh, formatting, formatting, it's not, <laughs> no formula. Uh, so if we take the square root, square root is what? You can take SQRT, you can do SQRT of this, that's, that means square root, or we already know um, square root is raised to one over two. No, right? Half power, that's square root. The same thing, right? 
site. Uh, then this is called what? This is called standard deviation. Okay. Standard deviation is the uh, actual life-sized picture, life-sized picture of the uh, uh, actual deviation, average deviation of each individual data point from the mean. Okay, so is everyone okay with this? Everyone is good up to this point? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. So, all right, then, you know, it's it's about good time to take a break, 10 minute break. So I'm gonna, uh, oops, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Uh, I will save just before I lose everything. Uh, I'm gonna turn it into a formula view uh, so that you can, if you are not there yet, you can, and then I will uh, freeze paint so you can scroll up and down. If you freeze paint right here using, you know, B2 as the, uh, like a uh, pivot point or whatever, uh, then you can scroll up and down, okay? All right. All right, so uh, I'll leave it on like this so you can take a look. Uh, and if you haven't yet uh, to finish up this, so let's take a 10 minute break, okay? 10 minutes, so I'm gonna.
All right, we're back. We're back. Uh, I hope everyone is back too. Um, I see seven people. Um, I see seven people and one inactive. Somehow, is this right? Malika left. So I have seven. And uh and i have nine uh in today's forum so two are missing um but this brings us i hope everyone um has uh completed this exercise and fully now uh cognizant of why we are doing this it's because uh uh, this brings us to the uh, the understanding of what you know the properties of normal distribution. What uh, the properties of normal distribution um, is like, and uh, this alone doesn't uh, do that. But um, But with this, we can apply, with this, we can apply the properties of normal distribution. And which is, you know, uh, uh, not only, um, okay, here, uh, we have already bypassed all these, you know, uh, formulas for vary, uh, variance and standard deviation. Uh, Mathematically, I'm going to have to come back to this because this is the way it is uh, expressed when it is uh, when the uh, 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 when it is weighted average by weight. I mean, if the weights are all different, but in our example, the weights cannot be all uh, weights are all the same. They all have the same probability of happening. Uh, but you know, normal distribution uh, would give us the probabilities, right? Uh, so we can predict the uh, future returns with probability more, you know, uh, more accurately with probability. Uh, but then we'll come back to the, the biggest, the biggest um, benefit we can derive from this is uh, basically how we uh, how we can prioritize uh, or how we can, uh, yeah, prioritize the assets in the, uh, in our stock portfolio. Okay, stock or bonds, you know. Uh, uh, as I said, bonds, bonds are relatively uh, tamed. In other words, uh, bond doesn't have bond doesn't have wild fluctuations like stocks you know you don't see uh, with bonds you don't see uh, this kind of standard deviation you don't see this kind of standard deviation bonds too. but you know um, stocks think about it from the mean of 3.36 Standard deviation of uh, 8.49, that's almost like, you know, uh, uh, 8.5, 3.4. So one standard deviation from the mean will be uh, like almost 12%, right? One standard deviation above the mean will be almost 12%. That means that means, uh, uh, see, there is about 34% probability, there is about 34% probability that uh, the next, uh, the return next month will be this, about 34% probability. But also, that means there is also 34% probability that it will go down uh, by 8.5%. So this minus, 8.5 will be like, you know, minus 5%, right? Minus 5, uh, uh, 
There was also like 34% probability it will be somewhere, right? Anywhere, uh, anywhere between. What I'm saying is uh, anywhere between 3.3 and minus 5%, right? Um, the probabilities of, in other words, to put it uh, differently, the probability of the next month return, the probability that the next month return will fall anywhere between uh, 3% and So between here and here, right, there is you know, about 34% probability that the next month return will fall somewhere here. Also, there is like from here to here, right? Uh, there is also about 34% probability uh, that the uh, uh, next month return will fall anywhere between here and here, right? Makes sense. So we can talk with probability, and also uh, deviation is you know uh, deviating from the uh, expected return mean. That's the risk. I mean, fluctuation of the return is the risk. You might wonder. Uh, most people think of only the downside risk. For example, they think of uh, I wonder if there is a uh, no. Okay, no. Uh, no ruler. Ugh. No ruler. So uh, I'll just have to draw very carefully. Okay. Why? Oh. So most. People think falling below uh, below this, I mean, you know, negative range or below the mean. Uh, most people think that's the risk. No, that's not that's not the only risk. Um, fluctuation by itself is the risk, right? Fluctuation of return, right? So in other words, the deviation is the measure. Standard deviation is the measure of average return, uh, average risk average risk, right? Risk is basically, you know, um, uh, losing your money, right? Uh, but most people, in, in most people's mind, that's what, but then, then that's called only downside risk, downside. Downside risk. Uh -huh. But upside risk is also the risk because risk is risk is basically the volatility, upside or downside. Volatility is the problem, right? Of course. Of course, um, without volatility, you can't win big. That's why there's a saying, the higher the risk, the higher the return. But vol if, if we can have uh, uh, expected return with, uh, think about it. Uh, if we can have uh, some positive return with volatility, then that's a very good thing. Um, uh, that's why we come to this 
and what does it, uh, what is, you know, what is it about? Suppose you have, you you have been screening the stocks far and wide for, <laughs> you have been screening stocks far and wide and uh, based on three, uh, two criteria, based on two criteria, uh, expect a return, that this means expect a return. Uh, uh, and this means, you know, uh, sigma, sigma is standard deviation, right? So based on the two criteria, two criteria, expected return, which is mean, right? And uh, standard deviation. Sigma is Greek character S. So uh, Greek character for S. Sigma is Greek character. So it means you know, uh, standard deviation. So we have, based on that, we have, we have selected X, Y, and Z, stock X, Y, and Z. So expected return of X is 25%, Y 30%. Z 10%. The standard deviation or the risk of X is 40%, right? Uh, 60%, 15%. Uh, they are all percentage, right? Risk is percentage because it's the uh, 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 variation or, you know, uh, uh, deviation from the mean, right? And average, you know, uh, like, you know, uh, with a 34% probability, you know, uh, uh, add, uh, you have 34% probability of ending up uh, anywhere between 25% and 65%, right? Yeah. Also, you have uh, the downside risk is you have also 34% probability of ending up anywhere between 25 and negative. 15%, right? But then think about it. Um, the I, I will change, you know, if X, I is X through Z. So uh, expected return of X, uh, this means expected return of X, E, then it will be E, uh, R, X, E, R, Y. I will, you know, so sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z. I is just, you know, uh, uh, like generic uh, notation there to, represent the individual assets. So then when we have something like this, then uh, some people might say, I'm going to pick, uh, 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 use it's a portfolio. You have three, these three stocks in your portfolio. So then if you have $1 million, if you have $1 million, next question is how do we allocate those $1 million? I mean, you're not going to put all $1 million into one stock. That's a, that's a no, no, that's a taboo. It's a, it's called, you know, uh, it's just, uh, it's fools, you know, it's stupid strategy because uh, you don't risk everything in one, right? As the saying goes, you don't put your nest eggs in one basket, you diversify. It. So you must diversify your portfolio and X, Y, and Z are, uh, we have to also, uh, uh, let's say let's say they are not very well correlated. Uh, we we need to also look at the uh, correlation of these stocks. But you know, uh, right now we're just looking at these uh, two criteria. So uh, if they are well diversified, you know, so we allocate money. And you you're saying you know I'm gonna put. So I'm gonna put most of my money into Y. And then uh, then into. X and into Z. And then you, uh, if I ask you why, oh, because, you know, uh, it has the highest expected return. But then that's only one criterion. It's just one criterion. Yeah. We have two criteria. So then by the risk, by the standard deviation, then why is the uh, one that you sh should stay away the most? I mean, if that's the case, you would have to put most money into Z because it's the least volatile stock least volatile stock, right? Um, so then how do we reconcile? How do we reconcile these two criteria? 
I mean, just because um, uh, we cannot go just by one criterion, then what do we do? Uh, we will use then uh, return risk ratio. This is called uh, you're dividing expected return by standard deviation. So it can be called mean return risk ratio or mean standard deviation ratio, mean standard deviation ratio or uh, Okay. Mean standard deviation ratio or mean variance ratio. You might wonder, it's not variance, it's standard deviation. Why I mean? Well, uh, they are cousins. You know, <laughs> if you square. Um, uh, the, they will, the ratio will uh, still be the same. I mean, not exactly the same number, but you know, I will have the same pattern, right? The ratio will have the same pattern. Or um, also another way is called uh, return risk ratio. Return risk ratio, okay? Now, why uh, this ratio? Now, let's think about the uh, the rationale behind ratio. This is exactly input output ratio. If you think about it, input output. And I've been talking about a lot. Uh, I've been talking a lot about input output ratio. Input output ratio measures the. Uh, productivity or uh, efficiency. It's simply productivity, but the uh, the highest ratio will be the uh, most efficient one, right? So think about it. Return is the, uh, I mean, um, the fruit. Return is the fruit of this investment, right? Return is the fruit of um, investing in these stocks. And the risk is the, uh, uh, the standard deviation is the risk that you take. So return is the output, right? Return is the reward for taking the risk. Return is the reward for taking the risk. So output is the reward for the input. Isn't it right? Output is the reward for input. You study hard, that's the input. And you get good grade, that's the output. You study, you don't study, you study <laughs> very little. You can't expect high output, right? It's the same thing. And think about it. This uh, typical example of uh, input-output ratio is the gas mileage, right? Uh, there has to be always a good, you know, logical reasoning behind. And gas mileage, which is also called, you know, um, fuel economy, it's exactly about how efficient the car is, right? Nobody will be. Everyone understands that reasoning. And gas mileage is exactly output to input ratio. Output is, you know, input is, you know, how many gallons. How many gallons does the car consume? The output is how many miles did it get for that, you know, uh, gallons of gas, right? The higher th this number is, the higher the efficiency or the fuel economy of uh, the car. So if you understand the uh, reasoning of the, uh, lo the logic of the fuel economy, it's not difficult to understand this. So then if you take this ratio, uh, Z is the best one. You will put most, you will put most uh, into Z and then into X and into Y. Uh, and then there is something called, you know, a coefficient of variation. Uh, the, book, the book uses, you know, uh, uh, we don't use the books. <laughs> but, you know, in the test, this term may come up. Coefficient of variation is exactly the 
reciprocal, reciprocal of um, the return risk ratio. Why do they use it? It's the same reason that in other countries, they use inverse gas mileage. You probably haven't heard of it. In the US, uh, gas mileage is, everyone, uh, uh, everyone understands that the, uh, in the US, everyone thinks of gas mileage as uh, how many gallons, I mean, uh, miles per gallon, right? But in other countries, fuel economy, gas mileage is uh, how many liters, most other countries, how many liters per kilometer. It's rather input to output. But you know, this ratio also makes sense. Why? US, you know, are plenty of gas, you know, US has, uh, not US imports oil from uh, OPEC countries, but they don't really, US simply does that because, you know, um, it is cheaper to import. But if, if it is, uh, but US has a lot of, US is the country that has the most oil reserves, not only now, in the future as well. Maybe in 500 years, US will be the only country that still pumps out oil. Other countries may have already, you know, depleted all its oil res reserves. So in the U.S., you know, gas price is cheaper. You say three point three dollars, you know, uh, eighty cents, you know, uh, is expensive. Go to other countries, South Korea, Europe, much more expensive because they they depend on they don't produce oil, they depend on import. For those countries. Gas mileage, expressing gas mileage this way is, uh, th that makes more sense because they want to save on gases. I mean, the lower, the lower the gas consumption, the better it is. The lower the gas cons consumption per kilometer, right? And that's, so that's why it's inverse gas mileage and then the same, same idea, the same idea. Coefficient of variation is the inverse return risk ratio. Right. So uh, everyone is OK up to that point. It's already uh, 234. Uh, you know, uh, it's time to call it a day. Uh, any questions so far? Any questions? Any questions? No. no? OK, no. Uh, Yian, you're only no. speaking for yourself. What about Leslie? Thank you. You confirmed that. All right. If there are no more questions, uh, uh, well, you know, that's it for today. Uh, have a great afternoon. And I think uh, quiz two is starting from today, but by this, you're ready to do quiz two, okay? Uh, all right, uh, uh, I will see you guys tomorrow at 12 p.m. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing uh, and stop recording. All right, take care everyone. Take care. Okay. All right, take Thank care. You. Okay, take care, Kyle and you, Yang. Sir. Take care, Kazuki. All right, take care, everyone. All right, stop recording.